thank you for joining us on the HSS podcast with me, Lenny Wenda, as we continue our conversation with Dr. John Kenga Song, the first director of the Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Nkenga Song is adding his voice to the titans of industry podcast conversations about developments in the vaccine manufacturing sector in Africa. Our fireside conversation today explores how the vaccine manufacturing sector is evolving since the efforts to accelerate change began in April 2021. So let's get started. One can critic the response, but in the end, if you didn't have control of the manufacturing, there was very little that you could do in terms of intervention anyway, except to trust that the multilateral system was going to serve our needs as well. So I completely understand the position that our leaders found themselves in. Now, we are working to change that. You have declared and pledged that we need to increase, we are going to increase manufacturing of vaccines from 1% to 60% in, in 20 years, by 2040, which yeah. is a big task. Right. But we have been having conversations with manufacturers all over the, the continent. There is so much that is happening. So how would you respond to a statement? I read, I read this yesterday. This author in, in Nature wrote that kickstarting successful vaccine manufacturing needs at least four key ingredients. Financing in the hundreds of millions of dollars, expanded R&D capacity, government commitment to buy vaccines that are produced locally, and indeed regulatory bodies that meet international standards. Now, this writer in Nature wrote that compared with other regions, African countries are lacking all of the four. What is your response? African countries have all of the above with the exception of the manufacturing of the, the ingredients. We have the human capacity. We have the, the, the money. If uh, this is a priority for the continent, they will make it a priority and commit money. And of course, if it requires that uh, the continent goes to borrow money to, to, make, uh, to make this happen, and if you consider this as uh, an existential threat and a serious health security, economic security, and national security, the same amount of attention and resources that uh, governments allocate to ministries of defense should be allocated. I think most countries in Africa, the, most, the vast majority of the budget goes to the ministries of defense. I would argue that shift some of that because you are at war. Okay, I don't know of any war that in Africa within one year has killed 180,000 people. So what is missing there? What is missing in this equation is the manufacturing of the, the, the ingredients. And no country, no particular country in the world does all of that. Okay, you import it from all over the world to, to, to do it. Canada doesn't produce vaccines, but they produce ingredients. Okay, I mean, some countries just produce their, their own contribution in vaccine manufacturing is in the glassware. Those little virus that they put vaccines in there to uh, uh, draw out a few shots for, for you and I. So it's a question of a political will and commitment and recognizing that it's a priority for, for the continent. China, India, Thailand, they all started up where we are today. And uh, thanks to a political commitment and, uh, they, and not just commitment, but the will to do it, they, they are there. I mean, the timeline of 20 years that we stated was not artificial. We studied countries, Brazil, Okay, and we said, how long did it take them to manufacture those vaccines? And it was around the 15, uh, 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 15 years timeline. Look, when we launched that initiative on April 12 and, and 13, where 40,000 people were on this uh, platform to discuss vaccine manufacturing in Africa, uh, besides Senegal, I think, uh, uh, and maybe Morocco and, and uh, 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 Egypt, very few countries were, were engaged in the process. Today, let's do the head counts. Algeria, Morocco, uh, um, uh, Egypt, South Africa, uh, Rwanda, Senegal, Nigeria, Uganda, Kenya, uh, Ghana have all engaged and actively, and they are at very different stages there. So I'm very proud of what I'm seeing on the continent. To an extent, I'm saying maybe the 20 years timeline was very generous. We could have tightened it to maybe 15 years and let it down. Now, Having said that, we have to understand the market dynamics that the, the arrangements that were put in place after the Second World War that centralized the health security uh, uh, apparatus of the world has to be reviewed, okay, and in very transparently and honestly that 
The house that you built 75 years ago is not the same house that uh, you need today. Okay, we have to review that, including the roads that you and I drive. I mean, the major highways that you have in intercities, they, oh, they expand it, they, they build. So the arrangement about vaccine procurement is simply, Gavi is the sole vaccine uh, um, uh, uh, buyer. And they take money from governments and from foundations, give it to China and India to buy, to produce vaccines and then ship to Africa. We have to sit down and review that setup because it's part of the health security apparatus that I'm referring to, to and say how, as companies are producing in Africa, how do we arrange ourselves so that vaccines you can buy from many more uh, uh, manufacturers in Africa? That is not difficult. Regulatory just came back from Morocco a few weeks ago. If you bring Morocco, South Africa, Ghana, regulatory agencies, Tanzania, mm. and a few others together, they give you a network. Okay, they, need, they, they give you a network. All you need is a political uh, underpinning of them that you empower these networks to be your regulatory body in Africa. You don't need a separate standalone uh, a regulatory body. By the way, the African Medicine Agency is moving on speedily, but even before that, I'm, I'm, I can assure you that if you bring all of this together, you get organized, then you can approve vaccines for use in, in Africa there. So I'm addressing those points by one, finance, human resource, regulatory issues, and the market reshaping there. If we do all of these things that uh, the Lancet author um, uh, uh, indicated that I think uh, everything else that is written on that paper, and I've read that paper, it becomes academic. I mean, I mean practically, I mean, if people of 1.2 billion cannot continue to mortgage their health security in the hands of others because of those kind of um, uh, 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 the article like that, that says you cannot do this, you cannot do this, you don't have this. We have all of that. Absolutely. And actually, I, it just so happens, a few days ago, I was speaking to um, Professor Petro uh, Terre Blanche, who's running the mRNA um, technology transfer hub in South Africa. And her, by her estimate, five years, <laughs> they will be uh, on their way to making quite a lot of vaccines for the region. So indeed, perhaps your 20-year timeline was very generous. People are mobilizing out there and they are looking to move a lot faster than that. Yeah. And from what we're hearing, uh, investors are stepping forward. The people leading these initiatives, they are saying, well, we thought money would be a problem. And we've been pleasantly surprised because there are so many investors who are stepping forward and wanting to fund these initiatives. So what we're really hearing is that there is a good understanding out there that the resilient production of vaccines, pharmaceuticals, raw material inputs at scale is, is, is understood as the underpinning for the security of our region, for, for nations in our region. Now, it's been four months since we, we had this, this big meeting where um, the, the initiative was really kick-started. What progress are you seeing? You know, what are some of the most significant developments that you're seeing in the manufacturing sector that really gives you hope that we are on our way? I'm happy you, uh, you share the optimism that I shared uh, uh, with these uh, timelines. Um, South Africa, the Aspen factory is doing fill and finish for Johnson & Johnson and all the vaccines, the 400 million doses of vaccines will be coming from the Johnson & Johnson. Mm -hmm. Baobab just signed an, uh, an agreement with, a, a, I think, Pfizer to uh, produce the, the mRNA vaccines. Rwanda and Senegal, just uh, last week or two weeks ago, were in Berlin, President Kagame the president of Rwanda and President uh, um, Maki Sal of Senegal all signed agreements with the Bountech. Um, look at what uh, uh, Nigeria is, is gearing up to uh, for in doing the same. The president of Ghana just launched uh, an institute for vaccine uh, production in, 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 in Ghana. And on my desk there, I see a letter from the president of, of Uganda expressing, uh, or not expressing, telling that they will start producing, engaging in that. I mean, so I'm very pleased with, with um, the, 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 the movement in the right direction. Imagine if on the 12th and 13th of April, we launch a, a huge initiative called the Partnership for African Vaccine Manufacturing. And if four months down the road, the question was no country has started thinking about it or is doing it, it would be a disaster, right? I mean, now we have the opposite problem of 
we are now convening meetings nearly every two weeks and say, look, let's work in an ecosystem. Let's coordinate our efforts. I mean, and let's, uh, hey, people, this is what it takes to produce a vaccine. So where in this ecosystem do you want to fit? It's a good problem to have. It's a good problem uh, to have because it says that there's interest and people want to, and they need guidance, they need coordination. And that's why the African Union and the Africa CDC comes in in a significant way to help uh, coordinate the efforts and make sure that we move in the right direction. Indeed, uh, we, we do have a good problem right now of trying to figure out where to take the money from because yeah. there's so much and uh, being offered. And even the technology transfer, we're hearing this quite a lot in terms of protein uh, uh, production platforms and, and all kinds of uh, technologies. But one area, though, that has come up, Dr. Nkengasom, where there they, they seems to be a little bit of a struggle in terms of uh, finding adequate or, or the right technology transfer partners is the mRNA platforms. I think they still perhaps a little need for more. What would you say to potential technology transfer partners who are looking at Africa and still hesitating because they're not quite sure about the opportunity that exists there? No, I think that I'm not so concerned with that. Uh, it, it, we have to do this in stages and in steps. And uh, the first step, we talk about technology transfer, but we should define the problems more broadly and not just talk about technology transfer, but technology co-creation. Okay, because my worry with the word technology transfer is that it gives the impression that um, the countries in developing world should wait, or in Africa should wait, and technology develop in China, um, United States, or Europe, and then transfer to you. It's all about knowledge. It's what is between your two ears. And I think we have plenty of that in Africa if, it's, if you incentivize it and if you uh, uh, um, actually invest in it, you get what you mean. I think Africa should accept that the first one will be around uh, perhaps technology transfer and appropriately so. But then we should immediately be thinking of research hubs and knowledge hubs across the continent where we can actually create knowledge. And to the extent that we use that knowledge in Africa for vaccine manufacturing and export some, it's not difficult to produce vaccines. I think let's not make it look like it's something that, I mean, I'm a virologist, immunologist, inactivated vaccines, simple. You grow the virus, yeah. kill it, and you, you go ahead and conserve it, and it's ready to go into somebody's arm. Not think that if you pull uh, young people together and put them in a research facility, pay them well, they will do it. The vaccines that are being produced in the West are produced by Africans, the Moroccan uh, researcher, the Turkey researchers are producing them. So what is the difference? The difference is that they are working in an enabling environment. So we need to be really think, take this seriously. And my fear is that we do not come out of this crisis documenting the lessons, but rather we learn lessons from it. There's a difference there. We can document the, the lessons by, by, by saying that look, this happened, we didn't have vaccines and whatever. Like we did for Ebola outbreak. The Ebola outbreak in West Africa, we documented. We wrote all kinds of good reports. The World Bank had a report. I think all uh, uh, European prestigious uh, institutions, uh, uh, public health institutions, uh, the London School had a report, uh, the Harvard had a report. The only report that I didn't see was a report from Africa describing our own issues. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we, we were written about by others who, so it was documented and we, we shared those ones and in, in the very good journals like the Lancet, the New England Journal and stuff. Learning a lesson is if we really do something. And I think we are learning a lesson from this vaccine situation where countries are stepping up and saying, I want to produce vaccines. Even if you start doing the fill and finish, okay, it is part of the ecosystem. You are somewhere inside the ecosystem of vaccine production. The next time around you add vaccine uh, production. Then the next time you add vaccine knowledge uh, creation, that is you put youngsters on the bench and they start creating knowledge and information that will be used for vaccine creation there. So we have to start somewhere and not try to get everything before we, 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 we start. It's a saying that you go to war with what you have and not what you need. I think we have to go to war with what we have and then we make progress. Absolutely, absolutely. We've been watching the debates with the J&J &J, um, agreement with Aspen and, and indeed the point that you make that it's a place to start. Perhaps it's not a perfect agreement, but it gets you started. It gets you on the way to where you want to get to. That's the main thing to remember. Now, Dr. Kengesong, African manufacturers are going to need a predictable market 
at scale to be able to sustain their businesses. You mentioned earlier that the infrastructure, the architecture, the global architecture that we have, where we have a single uh, mechanism for buying vaccines for 1.3 billion people is just no longer fit for purpose. Do we have leverage to be able to negotiate a much more fit for purpose, a much fairer uh, way of actually buying vaccines in African countries that would enable this industry, this nascent industry that we're trying to develop to actually blossom. I like the yellow uh, spot behind your screen, which says the Health Security and Sovereignty <laughs> podcast there. That is just exact. I don't think the question is whether we have this or we have that. The right question to ask in front of us today is how can Africa get there? Okay, and that is we have to wear our can-do attitude for our own health security and sovereignty. I mean, and I mean that is the only way that you can protect uh, 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 our own people and take our future into our hands. Then, but otherwise, our children and our grandchildren will ask the question, fundamental question of what were you doing and where were you when uh, the, the, it was very obvious that our health security, the enemy was an invisible enemy. It was not longer they would, uh, some country attacking you with a bomb, but that the enemy was around. We're dealing with this pandemic. Mm -hmm. Would there be another pandemic? Yes. And it's even more complex that underneath this pandemic, there's the HIV pandemic, which we are still dealing with in Africa. It might not be a pandemic in other parts of the world, but in Africa, it's still a pandemic there. So clearly, the market in Africa is gigantic. Today, the vaccine industry uh, counts for about uh, a market share of 1.2 billion, okay, in Africa. And projected by the year 2030, where the population of Africa will probably be around 2.5 uh, billion, the market will be around 2.4 billion dollars. So even if you have a few companies in Africa been fighting for that only in Africa, I think that will be, that will fit the market. Where population, the reason that I, I, I throw in numbers of, of uh, uh, num a population number is that you produce vaccines to use in people. So, I mean, it only tells you that the population will continue to need uh, to increase and to need vaccinations at all levels. They're not just vaccines for pandemic, but vaccine for routine immunization that has enabled you and I to be where we are today. I think I've probably received about 10 different kinds of vaccines from measles to mums to I meningitis to yellow fever to, to survive. So mm -hmm. because of the hostile nature of the environment that we live in. So that will continue to be the case. And even more with climate change and the emerging of and re-emerging of many more diseases. Look, between 1950, just around the period, some countries in Africa started achieving independence to now about 10 new infections have emerged. By viruses that were never there before, the chikungunya virus, the, 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 the monkeypox viruses, the HIV, the, the Ebola, they were not there. Okay, only to suggest to Africa that you have to look yourself in the mirror and say, can I continue to have my, or rather, how can I ensure my, my uh, 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 health security independence and only uh, uh, rely remotely and we shall always live in an interconnected world, but how do I rely less and less on the ability uh, for others to come help me in my own health security needs? It is a responsibility, the number one responsibility of any state to ensure the health security of their people, period. Absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So just looking at going back to some of these agreements, you know, in terms of dependence, how dependent we are or how much we trust others to meet their end of the bargain when we are discussing issues of health security. Western countries have imposed export bans and restrictions to protect their stockpiles. Uh, but when we've had similar agreements being made in poorer countries, like in South Africa, we haven't been able to insist on the same provisions that ensures the security or the protection of the people within our borders. I was reading yesterday the news that uh, now the, the export of the vaccines that are being filled and finished at Aspen has now been stopped. But could we have taken uh, a more aggressive stance or was it really more of a strategic consideration in terms of when one could have that conversation in terms of what's permissible? I think there's, uh, I always believe in the, 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 the saying that uh, two wrongs do not make a right. 
and and it's not because uh, uh, some Western powers uh, impose a ban on uh, those uh, important ingredients that we at Africa should do the same. I think we cannot condemn something, then we do the same thing on, on uh, turn around and do the same thing. I think yeah. it was an agreement that was reached when it, was, it became common knowledge that, uh, or public knowledge that uh, vaccines were being uh, filled and finished in, at the Aspen facilities and shipped outside. I think uh, the leadership of the continent, precisely our COVID champion, President Lamaposa, engaged personally in the conversation and worked out an arrangement. And it's very important to highlight that good behavior. He didn't say, I'm the president of South Africa, I'm going to ban you from moving this vaccine. He said, let's arrange so that uh, instead of shipping everything out, you ship some and you, keep, you maintain some on the continent. How reasonable could that have been? And I just wish that others could do the same that instead of banning the export of raw, this material, you say, we are going to keep X percentage for our own security needs, we'll allow you export that. That is the good behavior we want. So I think I, I stand uh, 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 to be corrected, and I'm also very satisfied with that approach that it, it showed that we cannot condemn a behavior at the same time you do the same, uh, uh, you, you practice the same behavior there. So I'm very uh, pleased with that leadership that was exercised by the government of South Africa. You're right. It, it is the African way. We always try to be accommodating of others, understanding and thoughtful to show our humanity. And it's unfortunate that we don't always get the same from others, but that's indeed the leadership that we, we were seeing there. Uh, but what we've seen, though, I think what is very well accepted now is that public health is a core pillar of national health security, of economic security, of African nations and national security in terms of keeping peaceful nations. Was there any point during this pandemic when the Africa CDC had to seek support from the uh, African Union military security apparatus, for example, to be, to, to be able to deliver and to get the job done? No, wonderful. I'm happy <clears throat> you said that. Let me first of all uh, recognize the remarkable leadership of the Commission, the African Union Commission, not the African Union. The African Union uh, that uh, last year was chaired by President Ramaphosa, and I've recognized the incredible and exceptional leadership that he exercised. But Chairperson Musa Faki, and uh, 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 who is the chair of the African Union Commission, has been extraordinary. I mean, the very first time I briefed the commission, he said, and empowered Africa CDC. Africa CDC are in charge. You take control of that. That is important. No interference there. And that, what does that mean? It meant that he opened the door for us to meet with the Peace and Security Council of the African Union mm -hmm. and to act, do the acts. In April of last year, when the airspace was locked, I mean, Ethiopian airline, Kenya airline, it was no flight flying across the continent. At the same time, if you know the, the trends in Africa, at that time, the, the, uh, country after country were reporting cases there, and there was total shortage of uh, epidemiologists, respondents there. So what did we do? We went to the Peace and Security Council of the African Union and said, look, we have a problem. We Countries are calling us the one help, but the airspace is locked. They said, what do you need? We said, we need military planes. So. They turned around and gave us that authorization. We approached uh, Cameroon and Uganda. Cameroon uh, gave us a plane. We actually uh, 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 loaned a plane from Cameroon and took it to DRC because we had, if you remember, there was an Ebola outbreak still raging in North, North Kivu. That plane flew into Kinshasa, took out 38 epidemi experienced epidemiologists and dropped them in Niger, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Cameroon. They are still there to today. Okay, it was the only plane at night that was flying across the continent, carrying responders in green jackets and dropping them from country to country. Mm -hmm. History should also remember that. That I mean, but it also speaks to the scarcity of responders that we have on the continent there. So I think um, the, the Africa CDC has leverage on all the assets that exist within the African Union to be able to deliver on this uh, mandate, given how young uh, the organization has been. We are only uh, uh, four and a half years old uh, the organization, but yeah. I must say that it was the greatest uh, wisdom and, 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 and uh, uh, vision that our head of state uh, expressed. And I'm very pleased that uh, to have been part of the, the initial uh, implementation of that wisdom and vision. 
Absolutely. Uh, you've shown quite a lot of youthful promise in the Africa CDC in terms of being able to deliver. Now, we, we have a national action plan for health security. And I just wanted to get your view whether this, this action plan makes provision and whether it should, if it doesn't, make provisions for designating or making pharmaceutical and vaccine manufacturing infrastructure sensitive uh, national or regional security assets, designating them as sensitive security assets that require special protections under the law? So the national uh, action plans for health security were developed after Ebola outbreak. And I would argue that most were not implemented. I think that is uh, uh, very, very uh, clear. So I think um, uh, we should always uh, we should step back from this crisis and ask ourselves the question as a continent, where do we go from here? Yes. As Africa CDC, we are saying that we need a new public health order. And uh, by saying this, you are not, uh, it's not opposing uh, 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 others. It's just saying where we sit today and living with the health security apparatus that was put in place uh, after the Second World War, we need to look at that for everybody's interest. And there are five key things that we are uh, arguing within the, net, the health security, uh, 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 a new uh, public health order for the continent. One is domestic financing, that you and only you yourself can raise resources to put on the table to protect your people. It is your own moral imperative to do that. And secondly, that uh, it is directly linked to our health uh, and economic and national security. This crisis, we are not going to recover from economic impact of this unless uh, we fight the virus, the virus that is costing us billions of dollars then. So domestic financing is very important. Second, we are saying, we, I start with that because any other thing that I would, I would state is linked to having good financing. Second is that our own national public health institutions must be strengthened. The likes of the, uh, the National uh, Communicable uh, Disease uh, center in South Africa, the, the Nigeria Centers for Disease Control Prevention, regional bodies like the Africa CDC must be strengthened in a very, very deliberate manner. A continent of 55 countries only have uh, 15 countries or so with the National Public Health Institutes. The National Public Health Institute are your military barracks that go out and fight this pandemic. They're, they're the, you know, the CDCs, the, your own US CDCs and whatever, the European CDCs, the China CDCs there. So where is your own military barrack to go fight used to? Thirdly is vaccine, diagnostics and pharmaceutical manufacturing. I am very concerned that the argument and discussion are skewed towards vaccines, but the diagnostics. Infectious disease threats, you start with diagnostics. In January of last year, if COVID had hit the continent, there was no country, including South Africa, that had the reagents and ability to test for, um, for COVID, period. So that has to change, and then and, and therapeutics there. Then we have to look at our own uh, uh, human resource. Okay, uh, capital, workforce. We only have 1,800 epidemiologists on the continent. If I just limit a, a conversation to epidemiologists, we need 6,000. Okay, we need 6,000. And if we keep, we keep training like 10 years and then we train 20 there, the next 50 years, you'll not get to 60,000. So as a continent, we need to sit back and have a discussion at the head of state level and say, look, we are at war. And this is not just a health crisis, it's an economic crisis, it's a health security crisis. How do we get to at least 4,000 responders in the next three years or so? We set that target and anybody else that comes in, we say, look, we have our targets. If you really want to support us, support us to get to this number. And lastly, that the partnerships that uh, our friends and collaborators who come to help us bilateral or multilateral should align with our priorities on, on the continent. That is the spirit of the new public health order that we are calling for. We are not so much into another tool that will be developed to measure where countries are and whether you call it a joint external evaluation or not. They tell you, they tell you what you know, okay? I mean, I can sit here and write a report on Cameroon and say, you, you, you need infrastructure, you need laboratories, you need healthcare workers, you need all of that. How does that fix it? But let's focus on those five areas of, of work and then we have a conversation 10 years from now, the continent will be more prepared to respond to 
a, a disease threat than it is now. Absolutely. And we, we really must invest in human resources in all of those things and make the money available because every, when we don't, it's costing us and setting us uh, decades in terms of development progress and investment, health development and general development uh, of, of our nations. 40 million people set back into poverty just this pandemic alone in the first year. We haven't even counted 2021 yet. So the cost is enormous to, to our nation, to our people. So we, we really do have to find that money. So if the right lessons were learned from the current pandemic, what would they be? I think uh, I just outlined the concept of a new public health order is informed by those lessons that have been learned. Yeah. Uh, that we didn't have respond, we don't have responders. Mm -hmm. uh, our, uh, our public health workforce is very limited. Our health workforce is very limited. A continent of about uh, 1.2 billion people has about 3 million healthcare workers that we do not manufacture than uh, our own health commodities, including. Now countries, when I go around the, the continent, I see countries producing uh, very basic personal protective equipment and whatever, but that is so basic that we should have been producing it a, a long time ago. And uh, it, it, just the elements that are listed in, in, in that, those are the key lessons that we should, uh, we should learn and not wait for um, uh, uh, an intervention to always come from, from outside. We should really take our own health security uh, destiny into our hands and have our sovereignty as you, you really uh, indicated in your podcast. Yes, yes, absolutely. A good call to action to our governments. And we certainly hope that our leaders continue to hold this matter with the level of importance that it, it, it requires in terms of you know, uh, protecting the security of, of our people. What would be your call to action uh, to potential industry partners and perhaps global procurement organizations, those people that will really be critical to making this succeed by helping that industry to develop and blossom? I think my call to action is simple, that we are in this together that it, this is no longer a health issue. It's not an issue of, uh, or a challenge of like malaria killing or cystic stomiasis killing a few people here and there that it disrupts and businesses suffer. So we need that public private philanthropic partnerships, the four Ps uh, to address this. And everybody, look, some of the greater uh, or uh, some of the major um, progress we've uh, have seen in this crises are, is, are due to partnership with the private sector, a partnership with uh, uh, someone like Mr. Stripe Masiwa, who was uh, a, a brain behind creating the, the, the African medicine supply platform, uh, which is what I call Amazon.com or Alibaba.com. You can go there today, Google, you see that platform there, it's amazing, and you order the uh, respond commodities. It's all the initiative, thanks to public-private partnership. Partnership with the UN Economic Commission for Africa, headed by uh, Dr. Vera Songwe, with all the, the businesses, the private sector, or the economic sector, recognizing that the economy will not grow if this issue is not addressed. Partnership with the, the banks, okay, the, the efforts, heroic efforts of the, uh, the Afri Exim Bank, uh, led by Professor Benedict Orama, and the, Af uh, the African Development Bank. So we need all, all of that partnership to come to the table, not just bring money to the table, but bring their thinking and technical uh, cap capabilities to uh, the, 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 the respond arena. That's what we need. I mean, uh, people like Mr. Stripe Masiwa could have come in and said, look, we're giving you $20 million, see you next year, and you tell us what you do with $20 million. It will not solve yeah. the problem. Right but they wrote, <laughs> exactly. They, 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 they rolled their sleep, they stayed on, and then, uh, it stands to the effort that we, uh, we've made uh, remarkable progress in, our respond, uh, in the respond theater. Wonderful, wonderful. I would love to continue this conversation, Dr. Nkengeson. There's so much to talk about, but I think I'm already in trouble with promise, so I better stop here. But I hope that you might be able to come back and continue to talk to us about some of the issues that we are dealing with um, out there and how we are uh, dealing with them. Dr. John Kengesong, Director of the Africa Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you so much for coming onto the HSS podcast. Thank you for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for watching.
If you like our work, please do subscribe, like, and share our content. We'd also love to hear from you. So do send us your comments and your feedback, including any other topics you'd like to hear from us. Mm -hmm.